Today, we'll be speaking about an overview of the history of the Hittite Empire. The Hittite Empire, or the uh, the Kingdom of Hatti, as it was known by its own people, was made up of a variety of ethnic groups. But the ruling class was mostly what they would call Neshali, or what scholars called Hittite. They were an Indo-European people who entered the Anatolia at around 2000 BC, according to our best estimates. There they encountered other Indo-European people, such as the Luvians and the Palaic people, along with indigenous cultures to Anatolia, such as the Hattians, the Kashkins, and of course the Hurrians. The recorded history of Anatolia begins with Assyrian trade expeditions to certain centers in eastern and central Anatolia, such as Kanesh and Khatusha, which were cities that played a large role in the formation of Hittite identity. The Hittites themselves were Indo-European, but in many ways their culture followed broader ancient Near Eastern trends that dated back to Sumeria. Their culture was strongly influenced by the Mesopotamian and especially the Hurrian religion, along with the syro canaanite religion and the Luwian religion and culture. The Hittites have therefore been referred to as the people of a thousand gods because they were so eager to adopt any foreign religious practice into their worship in order to maintain a sort of like Pax Diorum or divine peace. The Hittites, however, were not alone in this practice. Almost every ancient Near Eastern society engaged in this sort of religious syncretism. We would see this all over Can Canaan as well, where Canaanite deities that were indigenous to the region were worshipped alongside Akkadian, Hurrian, Egyptian, and in some cases, various other deities from around the ancient Near East. But the, Hur but the Hittites certainly took it to a different level. So the Hittites essentially started out in the city of Kanesh and were called by ethnicity them by as an endonym the Neshali people. Anita of Kusara was an early ancestor of the Hittite kingship. In these early days, the Hittites sort of acted like perhaps you might say a warrior culture or sort of like a warrior aristocracy or even republic centered around a band of warriors called the Pantush, who served a king who was elected from among their ranks. However, through the Hittite Old Kingdom, power became gradually more centralized in the hand of a central ruler. And this allowed to and the initial expansion of the Hittite Empire from central Anatolia in all directions, particularly towards the Hurrian East and ultimately into Syria and Mesopotamia. So, initially, the Hittites were a center where resources were derived or traded from further west or north to the wealthy kingdoms of Syria and Mesopotamia. However, the Hittites tired of dealing with these middlemen, or at least wanted to control the trade through these middlemen and profit from it. So their initial conflict was with the kingdom of Yamhad. The Yamhad was a northwest Semitic kingdom in northern Syria around the city of Aleppo that practiced Canaanite religion and had many Canaanite customs as well as an increasing degree of Hurrian influence and close relations with the Hurrian kingdoms around the area, particularly the Hittite rival of Kizuwatna in what was later known as Cilicia, 
Ultimately, it was these smaller Hurrian kingdoms that pulled the Hittites and the Yamhad kingdom into conflict, which was initially very successful for the Hittite king. He defeated the Hurrian allies of the kingdom of Yamhad, and before being, but after, eventually was murdered by his own relatives. However, the next king, Mershali I, would himself succeed in defeating the kingdom of Yamhad, which was at that time the strongest power in the ancient Near East. He captured the city of Aleppo and destroyed it and carried off their idol of Baal. Furthermore, he then went and toppled the dynasty whose famous, most famous member was Hammurabi, the Amorite dynasty of Babylon, and captured their city and sacked it, didn't hold it, but carried away their most valuable idol, Marduk, from the Esagila. Having thoroughly established their name on the world stage as this almost like sacrilegious and an overly violent northern empire. This sort of toppled, you know, the Amorite control in the Middle Bronze Age and set into motion what we call the, the Late Bronze Age. However, the Hittites themselves became con contracted due to the collapse of the situation in northern Mesopotamia and Syria because they relied upon the trade and their regional rivals, especially to the west with the Luwians, who uh, formed the Arzawa Confederacy, and the Kashkins and the Hayasha Azi, who were a Hurrian confederation to the east, sort of provided this pressure into the Hittite heartland of uh, central Anatolia itself, which unfortunately for them, caused a contraction which enabled a new regional power to arise, which was also an Indo-European people who had found the kingdom of the Mitanni. The kingdom of the Mitanni, as is attested by their personal names, seems to have uh, come from the same Indo-Iranian stock as the Vedic Indians and worshipped a lot of the same deities. And the kingdom of Mitanni easily found itself a place in the power vacuum left by the Hittite sacks of Aleppo and Babylon and established themselves on the northern Euphrates, the Khabar River, eastern Syria, that, that, whole, that whole region, and were able, was able to exert influence all the way to the Mediterranean, sort of like the highlands and lowlands, highlands of northern Mesopotamia and eastern Anatolia, the Taurus Mountains, and the plains of Assyria as well, over the local Akkadian and especially Hurrian population. In fact, Mitanni was so thoroughly Hurrianized in its material culture that for many, many cases, there's very, very little distinguishing the Mitanni elite from their Hurrian population, apart from their Indo-Iranian names. It is a very much like a parallel situation culturally to how the Vedic Indians uh, adopted so many cultural elements that were indigenous to India, from the Dravidian peoples and the Australasian and Austronesian peoples who were previously, and so, you know, Tibetan people who were originally inhabitants of the, 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 the lands of India and eventually created a cultural melting pot. However, the Mitanni Empire enjoyed a far better reputation among the local people than the Hittites did at the time. This was because of the great deal of uh, support that the Mitanni government would give to their vassal kings and the high level of autonomy that they would give them. Now at about this time in the uh, 15th century BC, when Mitanni is at its height, this is when the Egyptian empire has sort of pushed out the Hyksos, who may have been Hurrian and may have been Kemerites, 
from the northern portions of Egypt, in Lower Egypt, in the Delta region particularly, and had pushed into southern Canaan. Now, the Canaanites as a whole had enjoyed very good relations with the Syrian Canaanites to the north, who were in fact vassals of the Mitanni Empire. And this sort of connective system of alliances between southern and northern Canaan, and furthermore to the Mitanni Empire, dragged the Egyptian Empire and the Mitanni Empire into a series of conflicts over Syria and, the, and Palestine. The initial conflict would sort of begin with the siege of Megiddo, where the prince of Kadesh, Darusha, with significant degree but not sufficient Mitanni support, was defeated by the pharaoh Tutmos III due to his audacious attack the most directly possible, even if it puts you in danger. Sort of like, when you have a very cautious enemy, they're going to expect that you're going to be cautious like them, but if you're very bold, almost to the point of being stupid, it's almost the smartest thing to do militarily. That's why they sometimes consider like <coughs> Tutmos III, the Napoleon or the Hannibal of Egypt, because of his audacious boldness in taking the fight directly to the enemy, even putting himself in danger in the Aruna Pass. However, the Mitanni Kingdom and Egyptian Kingdom would fight a series of wars, which are poorly attested, but it is clear from the campaign records of Tutmos III that eventually... A sort of border was drawn between the two empires along the Orontes River. On the north and eastern side of the Orontes River would be somewhat under the jurisdiction of the Mitanni Empire, and what was to the south and the west of the Orontes River would be under the jurisdiction of the Egyptians. And this sort of entente between the two powers, which was sealed by diplomatic marriages, lasted for about 70 years which was one of the longest periods of great power peace in the ancient Near East, especially in the late Bronze Age. However, internal divisions in the Mitanni court, along with a strong resurgent Hittite rule in the form of Shupiluliuma, who had, you know, as the younger son and general of the Hittite King Tudhalia II, pushed back the regional Anatolian enemies of the Hittite Empire, he set upon to once again push into the wealthy lands of Syria and impose a treaty of vassalage upon the Mitanni Empire. So ultimately, Shupiluliuma had battled the, the Mitanni king, Tushrata, and, of course, the pressure on the Mitanni kingdom allowed a pretender to rise up in the form of Artatama II and his son after he was killed, Shutarna III, who ultimately carried on a civil war between himself and Tushrata's own son, Matiwaza. Meanwhile, the Hittites were looking at the situation. They were like, yeah, they're weakening themselves off. We don't need to fight them anymore. We'll vassalize whoever's the winner and we'll clean up their opponents basically for them. We'll, we'll, we will wipe the floor with whoever and we'll just choose whoever's going to seem like he's going to be the most loyal to us. So having Mitanni in this state of chaos, they eventually pushed into Western Canaan, uh, sort of like alongside parallel to the Orontes River. They conquered Mukish. They conquered Tunip and Katna, and particularly the kingdom of Nuhashe, which was an important kingdom at the time. Now, up to this point, they're just conquering vassal kingdoms on the Mitanni side of the Orontes, which were basically acting as independent and generally do, but especially since the Mitanni kingdom is so weak and fractured at the moment. However, the king of Kadesh, Shututar or Sutarna, ultimately had his own alliances and ties to the kingdoms in north, 
in the uh, Mitanni side of the border and had familial ties to the kingdom of Mitanni through a marriage with his daughter to a son of King Shutarna II of Mitanni, who would have been uh, the uncle of the current king of Mitanni, Matiwaza. So ultimately, he wanted to apply pressure against the Hittite kingdom to protect his allies in Mitanni. And of course, Kadesh always had sort of like stronger ties to Mitanni than it did to its official overlord in Egypt. So Shutarna, he takes his Shutarna of Kadesh. <laughs> There's a lot of Shutarnas in the story. It's just a very common Hurrian or, or Mitannian name. So he took his chariots and he went straight at Shupiluliuma, who wasn't expecting it. He did not want to predicate attack against the kingdom of Egypt. However, he was sort of forced to battle this king who was very bold and reckless and ultimately captured King Shutarna and imposed upon the city of Kadesh his own puppet or vassal Etakama who <laughs> sort of had a double face. So he would claim, I'm loyal to Hit the Hittites, but he would still protest his loyalty to Egypt. And ultimately, this was an untenuous situation. A similar situation existed in the hinterland kingdom of Amuru, which under Abdiashterta became a strong regional power where he used his Habiru mercenaries to basically carve out a niche for himself from the uh, western side of the Orontes River Valley through to the Phoenician coast, strongly battling the Egyptian loyalist uh, vassal king of Byblos, Ribhada, as is recorded very in detail in the Amarna Corpus. Amuru was a, under uh, Abdiashirta's son, Aziru, ultimately tried to court the favor of the Hittites because during this period, the Egyptian power seemed much, much weaker and Azru thought he could get a better deal with the Hittites. Now, he was officially on the Egyptian side of the Orontes, which was the dividing line between Egypt and her ally in Mitanni, which had now basically become subject to Hittite will. So this, these two situations where loyalist governors or mayors of the different Canaanite cities were predicating an attack by Egypt, this brought Egypt into conflict with the Hittite Empire. And had it been a strong pharaoh like you know, Tetmose the Third, Ahmose, Amenhotep the First, any of these such that pharaohs, even Amenhotep the Third, who was more interested in building and marriage relationships and diplomacy and sex, would have probably done far more than Akhenaten or his direct successors. However, the Egyptian power was really waning at this point due to the focus of the pharaoh on religious matters of his cult of the Aten. So, especially with the death of his competent mother, Tia, who sort of kept the empire together, it became up to these feuding bureaucratic and military officials, particularly I in the bureaucratic service and Horemheb in the military, to sort of like handle these these crises in Syria. And Horemheb uh, was ultimately dispatched to Syria to sort of deal with the crises. And he did meet the Hittite commander, Shupiluliuma. And while he wasn't able to defeat Shupiluliuma in battle around Kadesh, he was able to predicate the fall of that auspicious king through the transmission of a disease and a plague. The Egyptians brought with them a very virulent plague, and the Egyptian prisoners who were captured by the Hittite king ultimately spread the plague very strongly 
into the Hittite Empire, which eventually took the life of the Hittite king, Shubiluliuma himself, and his chosen successor, Arnawanda I. Ultimately, though, this proved to be a blessing in disguise, because the next king of the Hittite Empire, Mershali II, proved to be a more than competent successor to his father. Mershali II was a very pious king, and he sort of troubled himself with sort of like peace with the gods as a result of the supposed impropriety of his father, Shubiluliuma I, in overthrowing his brother, Tutalia III. Mershali accepted upon himself the task of reinvesting the Hittite Empire in their religious traditions. And of course, during his, this, his early reign, he was very young. So a concern that he would have to face was the traditional enemies of the Hittite Empire, like the regional enemies in Anatolia, who had less economic value to control than Syria, but proved to be a existential threat to the empire itself. That is the Luwians in Arzawa and the, Ka the Kashkins on the Black Sea coast and the hurrying kingdoms of Hayasha Azi ultimately would test each new green Hittite king. But ultimately, Mershali proved incredibly successful, just as his father did, in dealing with these foreign threats, despite his young age and the mocking tone his enemies took with him. In fact, he managed to secure the western frontier and the eastern frontier and the northern frontier of the Hittite Empire, for quite a while, sort of entering the Hittites into a golden age of power where they had complete hegemony over Anatolia. An interesting event that a few interesting events that happened during Mershali's reign was during the siege of Apasso, which would later be known as Ephesus, where the king was of that city was literally wiped out by a falling meteor. That was an interesting occurrence. And the second interesting cosmological event was the uh, the eclipse that happened, the complete solar eclipse that happened during Mershali's reign, which allows us to pretty safely date the, the chronology of this period. And naturally, Mershali was not the sort to miss an opportunity to assign religious meaning to either of these cosmological occurrences. Mershali II was very effective at maintaining diplomatic relationships with the Hittite vassals in Syria, maintaining a good relationship especially with the kingdom of Ugarit, which proved to be an invaluable ally to the Hittite Empire for both its trade and its naval power. So, going on from there... The Hittites themselves were relatively unchallenged in the region. However, the fall of the 18th dynasty predicated upon itself the rise of a much more effective ethnically Canaanite dynasty from the Delta region, which was the Ramsite dynasty. Ramses I was a sort of protege of the general Horemheb and was chosen as his successor partially due to the fact that Horemheb himself had no living heirs, and the fact that Ramses I had a reasonable degree of fecundity in his production of heirs, having already, before he assumed fair pharaonic rule, a son and a grandson who showed great aptitude for martial skill. Ramses I did not rule a particularly long time, but his son Seti managed to, Seti I managed to put the fight back towards the Hittites and ultimately captured the city of Kadesh. And his son Ramses II, also called Ramses the Great, was the pharaoh that would most strongly be associated with conflict with the Hittites. The Hittites themselves, 
were beginning to undergo a sort of power struggle between the pharaohs, between the Labarnas, uh, the great king, uh, Hattusili, and his uh, uncle, uh, Muatali. No, no, it's the king Muatali and his uncle, Hattusili. So, they gather up all their vassals, and the king of Egypt, Ramses II, gathers all his vassals. And, of course, the position of the Hittites at this point is looking more strong. But Ramses II is like to, uh, his predecessor, Tutmose III, a very audacious commander. However, the Hittite commanders were not ignorant of this fact and did not fall into the same mistakes Jerusha did. They were very eager to take advantage of the reckless nature of Ramses II. Ramses II was very much in a rush to uh, engage with the Hittites, and on account of the Shasu spies that the Hittite king sent to mislead the pharaoh, who said that the king of the Hittites was still very far away and was in a vulnerable position. However, the king of the Hittites was actually far nearer than the pharaoh was aware of and was preparing an ambush. So when Ramses II was pulling ahead with his chariot force and leaving his infantry forces behind, this was the moment where the Hittites were able to pull their trap and send in their own chariots. This sort of engaged the, the largest chariot battle recorded in all of human history. As far as we are aware, there could be greater chariot battles in India or China. The scale of battles in those such countries tended to have been exaggerated even beyond what was possible in the ancient Near East. But carrying on, the uh, Hittites are surrounding the king, and the king is fighting for his life. It is very likely that the king at this point, the, the pharaoh of Egypt, would be captured or killed in battle. But the Kenite and the Arun, the heavy infantry from the Kenite vassals, ultimately proved the, def the deciding factor in saving the king, allowing the king to escape this battle and declare victory despite no change happening to the status quo. And ultimately it results in a draw. There was a continuation of war and conflict between the two sides on and off for several years. Ultimately, the status quo proved very difficult to budge, whereas in the East, new threats were sort of arising. The Mitanni kingdom, which had at this point become a weak and subordinate vassal to Hatti was themselves losing control of their eastern vassal, the kingdom of Assyria, who was making strong gains against the Mitanni, along and also the Kassite kingdom of Babylon, pro, pro, becoming almost like another superpower in the east and a strong threat to Hittite rule in Syria. So ultimately, the Hittites who were winning the war, essentially, were threatened from the east. And the Egyptians, who were really not accomplishing very much, but had to make spin it so they actually would win, the two of them came together and drew up a peace treaty, which is not the earliest peace treaty in recorded history, as some might say, but was a very significant peace treaty in that it predicated great power peace between the Hittite Empire and the Egyptian Empire, just as there had previously existed between the Egyptian Empire and the Mitanni Empire. This peace proved very effective. This led to sort of like the final golden age of Egypt and Hatti altogether, trade strongly flourished during this period, the 13th century BC. The incredible wealth 
that was generated by this free trade between the great powers of the time ultimately did attract the wrong sort of attention, particularly among the traditional enemies of the Hittite Empire and the traditional enemies of the Egyptian Empire. The traditional enemies of the Hittite Empire themselves being the Luwians to the west, such as the Luca or Lycians, the uh, Arzawans, and ultimately these people who were seafaring and trading on their own had ties through the Mediterranean to the islands of the Aegean, to Crete, to Greece, mainland Greece, to uh, Western Mediterranean in Sicily and Sardinia, to Thrace, the Balkans and all that. Well, they, they sort of got together and said, we're going to work together and invade the wealthy civilized nations of the Near East and pillage them. And of course, this was also predicated by an environmental collapse, a spate of earthquakes and famines and droughts beginning in the Mediterranean, sort of like beginning in Anatolia and and Greece. This led to the collapse of the Mycenaean civilization and ultimately the refugees of these various different ethnicities came together, pushed through the Hittite Empire, and wiped them out, practically. Or did it? But they white went through Syria and ultimately only the, only the Egyptians were able to hold them back from destroying their state, and it was a much weakened state. This created a vastly different status quo. Anatolia, which was a fertile region, but very vulnerable to environmental changes, essentially became unviable for agriculture. It relied very heavily on regular precipitation, hence the propensity of the, the inhabitants of that region to worship weather-based gods like Teshub of the Hurrians and Tarhuntas of the uh, Hittites and Luwians, well, that was all kaput. Now, there was a significant remnant of the Hittite state that held on for a while in Syria and ultimately fractured into smaller neo-Hittite states into the Iron Age. The most famous and significant artifact of the Hittite Empire in terms of depicting their royalty is the head of Shupiluliuma II. And if you Google the name Shupiluliuma in image search, you will find this kind of disturbed looking bust. This does not depict the famous Shupiluliuma, Shupiluliuma III. This depicts a much later, far more uh, Syrianized Hittite ruler, Shupiluliuma II, sort of at the very tail end of the Hittite kingdom before the, the rise of the Neo-Hittite states. And the Neo-Hittites held on for a fair while. They had a certain degree of wealth and prestige that was apparently left over from their imperial period. Many temple sites were built around this time, such as the temple complex of Aindara, which was unfortunately destroyed by the Turkish military in an attack that strongly mirrors the ISIS destruction of the Temple of Bel at Palmyra, but isn't talked about as much because the Turkish government is a legitimate state entity and an ally of the U.S. and therefore cannot commit acts of terrorism or vandalism against archaeological sites. So the Hittites, but they, it was a strong source for understanding the physical makeup of the Hebrew temple, as it was assumed to have a similar structure to what is described in the Old Testament about the Hebrew temple. And interesting facets of the Indira temple, which have since unfortunately been destroyed, were the basalt lions and a giant stone footprint of unknown origin or reason 
everyone knows the old archaeological uh, joke that if we don't understand it, it's for cult purposes. Since it was a temple, that seems like a fairly decent guess as well. But there's a lot of theories as to what the the stone footprint is. Ultimately, the Assyrian Empire would put an incredible amount of pressure on these remnant Hittites, these Hittite kingdoms of northern Syria. And the whole region became roughly homogenous under a new culture of Aramaeans, Aramaic speech, which became sort of a lingua franca of the Assyrian Empire, despite the initial em language of the Assyrian Empire being Akkadian. Ultimately, the Assyrians wound up spreading the language of their subordinates and oftentimes enemies, the Aramaeans. So Aramaic becomes the almost universal language of the ancient Near East. The Hittite kingdoms are fully absorbed into the, the regional empires such as Assyria, Damascus, or Persia, Babylon, or what have you, till the Syrian culture becomes this sort of like mixed but relatively homogenous culture combining all these civilizational aspects from previous entities and from more recent entities. And that's sort of where we find the end of the Hittite Empire, the Hittite, the Hittite Empire and culture, not with a bang, but with sort of like a fizzle. As with many cultures in history, the Hittites uh, were not wiped out in a so much by a glorious conquest by another empire, but were slowly eroded down until there was nothing left that was distinctive about them. And they were ultimately forgotten for thousands of years apart from some non-specific mes uh, mentions in the Bible, which referred to them as simply another Canaanite tribe. It wasn't until the 1920s where their primary cult centers at the primary centers at Boazkoi and Alajahuk were discovered and allowed modern scholarship to study the Hittites, which are a fascinating and relatively unknown topic. And I'm glad for you sticking around till the end. I was nice having you. We'll talk about another kingdom on the next time.